the world is impacted. Jamaica, Zimbabwe, Antigua, the United States of America, none has been spared from the tyranny of the death of suicide. It is our conviction that suicide is preventable. It is against this background that we welcome you to another educational and empowering session to help us make a difference in the lives of hurting people by developing strategies for intervention and prevention. Welcome to our participants from Jamaica, from the wider Caribbean, North America, Europe, and even as far as Zimbabwe in Africa. Special welcome to our guest speaker, Professor Rory O'Connor and Professor Murad Khan, leaders of the International Association of Suicide Prevention. Extra special thanks to our sponsors. Recording in progress. Houses. Extra special thanks to our sponsors. Our premium sponsor, Jamaica Broilers, has been with us for three years, and we say much gratitude. We welcome our bronze sponsors, IDB, Unicom, and Hawkeye, and our session sponsors, Jamaica Institute of Financial Services, Guardian Group, Foundation, Barita, and Digicel. We are extremely grateful for your support in hosting this life-changing event. The event will run from now right up until 4.30, and we invite you to benefit to the maximum as we go through today's event. We will start with an opening ceremony. That is what we are experiencing right now. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator for the opening ceremony, Dr. Gary Rule. He is an outstanding internist, now a Jamaican now living in the United States of America. He has a passion to assist with people who are hurting. He has a passion to help people with mental health issues. Let's make welcome our moderator for this morning's opening ceremony, Dr. Rule. Good morning. My video needs to be turned on. Thank you. Please go ahead, Dr. Rue. It says you stopped my video, but I'll, I'll go ahead. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Thomas, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And sir. certainly good morning to you. Uh, distinguished guests, dignitaries, friends, families, students especially, wherever you are in the world, good morning, good afternoon, good, good afternoon, and or good night. I am Dr. Girarul, I'm the moderator for this session. And welcome again, as Dr. Thomas said, to the 13th staging of the annual World Suicide Prevention um, Day, hosted by Choose Life International. We have an exciting day planned for you. And first and foremost, I wanted to say that this program is about saving lives. Saving lives every day, reaching out your hands. It's a call to action. So as we listen to the esteemed speakers today, keep that thought in mind. It's a call to action to let you know that persons who are living with a mental health condition, with mental illness, persons who are thinking about suicide, to let them know they're not by themselves in this journey and that help is available. Just to repeat some of the facts that Dr. Thomas mentioned, as you keep this in mind, data from the World Health Organization tells us about 700,000 persons each year die by suicide. That's about one person every 40 seconds. Specifically for Jamaica, about 25% of adolescents Think about suicide. That's persons ages 13 to 17 years old. And about 18% of them actually attempt suicide. That number is really unacceptable. 
this day is a call to action to make a difference in those persons' lives. Suicide is preventable. And so the word I want you to remember as we think about today is, what can I do? What action can I take to make a difference in a young person's life, in an adult's life, as they think about ending their own life? What can I do to make a difference? Please know that you're not alone. Finally, I kind of just want to touch on five core principles that Choose Life International uses as their core steps in helping to save a person's life. In that regard, these are suicide prevention. Today is part of that event. Trauma-informed interventions and therapy. Conflict resolution strengthening basic skills around resiliency and recovery, and finally, the art and science of happiness. This conference is timely, it's purpose-driven, and it's action-driven. You will hear from dynamic speakers that will help us think about and de develop a toolkit so that we can help save persons' lives. That's really what this is about today. It's a call to action. So without further ado, I'd like to first continue to have the Reverend Dr. Peter Garth, president of the Umbrella Group of Churches in Jamaica, deliver a prayer for us. Reverend Garth, please. Thank you very kindly. Let us pause for prayer. Almighty Father, we bow in your presence today. And we would like to thank you for Choose Life International. We thank you for Suicide Prevention Day and for this seminary, this seminar that has been planned. We pray that you will cause that the speakers will indeed create the impact that we desire that their words will create. We ask that the participants might become more aware of the danger that faces the world and the countless millions who have committed suicide. You have called us to guard marital life, spiritual life, and mental life. And so we ask today that indeed the expectations of Choose Life International will certainly be met. And we pray that together, we will be able to work to decrease the suicide rate in Jamaica. And this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and everyone says, amen and amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Garth. Next, we will hear from our very own Dr. Nadine Williams, Director of Health Services, Planning and Integration from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Dr. Williams. Dr. Donovan and Mrs. Faye Thomas, Professor Rory O'Connor, conference organizers, all moderators, presenters, mental health practitioners, specially invited guests, persons on the platform, Members of the media, Dr. Rule, good morning. A life lost is always a difficulty, but a life lost to suicide is a tragedy because it suggests that someone thought there was not enough to hold on to, not enough resources, not enough love, not enough hope. And it is therefore without reservation that I endorse this year's theme for World Suicide Prevention Day, creating hope through action. This most notorious pandemic has unearthed unknown pockets of vulnerabilities in various groups, which we did not know before, such as our healthcare workers, unprotected children and the elderly, whose rhythm and usual cues have been disrupted, precipitating and accelerating physical 
and mental frailty. The actions taken through the Ministry of Health and Wellness include the restoration of a Jamaica Moves exercise program hosted on the television and accessible to many. The launch and escalation of mental health campaigns Speak Up, Speak Now, which urges persons to identify their vulnerabilities and share their pain. It engenders empathy and destigmatizes mental health and as such lowers barriers to access to mental health. Or Reach Out Rangers program, which has trained volunteers and existing health aides in psychiatric first aid to identify the vulnerable and mitigate the risk through intentional contact and strategic follow-up. The elderly and those affected by COVID is an especially targeted group. And our mental health and suicide prevention helpline, which was launched in October, 2019, this has seen some more and more persons reaching out for help, both COVID and non-COVID related. The surges in our pandemic has paralleled an accompanied surge in the numbers of calls. With every wave, there has been a spike in the number of calls, both our women and men, or men in particular, we reach out to, and we acknowledge the fact that they have reached out. They have been, over the last few years, victims of suicide, more than three times the numbers of women who have been victims of suicides, and they too have been reaching out, and to this we are grateful. Our healthcare workers, as one well of our most vulnerable, have a dedicated window in this forum, and this is a targeted group. If we are encouraging persons to speak up, we must have a place where they can be heard intelligently and intentionally. Our mental health helpline, 1888 New Life, is one such place. Your organization at Choose Life International is one such place. The old adage, joy shared is double the joy and sorrow shared is half the sorrow, bears repeating. We do recognize that many organizations have opened virtual doors at this time and we congratulate you at Choose Life International for providing a space where persons can regularly be encouraged and find solution, where persons can find hope. Our numbers of suicide have reportedly declined significantly over the last year, and we would like to think our toll-free line intervention has contributed to that decline. And yet, the fight continues as one suicide is one too many. Let us then continue to work together, partners in the vineyard, each one our brother's keeper, as we create much needed hope through our various actions. May I wish for you a successful and impactful conference from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for those, for those words. Next, we'll have greetings from the Jamaica Broilers Group. Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Cameron, the Group Public Relations Manager here at Jamaica Broilers Group Limited. I bring you greetings on behalf of our President and CEO, Mr. Christopher Levy, and the entire family here at the JBG. It's our privilege to be on board again as a sponsor of yet another of Choose Life International's annual suicide prevention initiatives. This conference is not just another event, this is an opportunity for you for your family, your company, your church, your school, your people to invest in life and life more abundant than that. At Jamaica Broilers, we firmly believe that investing in people's lives is part of our work towards building the kingdom of God here on this earth. We have a saying that we raise chickens, but we're in the business of impacting lives. Our hope today is that whatever you do, and whichever organization you represent, that you will be able to see your purpose as a tool to impact the lives of others. And today, more specifically, the lives of those who have lost hope. This has been a tough season, 
but God's grace has always been enough. He chose our lives by taking up a cross. If nothing else, that is a tremendous demonstration of the value he places on each one of us. Today's conference signals our choice to help someone else see that value and to choose life in him. Thank you so much for joining today. Have an amazing experience and may God bless you. Thank you so much. That's great to hear that the corporate persons are involved in helping saving a life because that's def definitely needed. We can't do this alone. Thank you, Jamaica Broilers Group. Next, uh, we are going to hear from Mrs. Sharon McCarthy, Corporate Service Executive, Choose Life International. Mrs. McCarthy. Thank you, Dr. Rule. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This morning, we are privileged to have as our special guest speaker, the president of the International Association for Suicide Prevention, Professor Rory O'Connor. Professor O'Connor has a long-standing interest in suicide research and prevention. He has been working in the field since 1994. He's professor of health psychology at the University of Glasgow in Scotland and past president of the International Academy of Suicide Research. Professor O'Connor leads the Suicide Behavior Research Laboratory at the University of Glasgow, one of the leading suicide and self-harm research groups internationally. He has published extensively in the field of suicide and self-harm specifically concerning the psychological processes which precipitate suicidal behavior and self-harm. In addition, he's author of Understanding Suicidal Behavior, along with Noel Sheehy, co-editor of the Rutledge Major Work Series on Suicide with Keith Horton, and co-editor of the International Handbook of suicide prevention. He is also author of When It Is Darkest, Why People Die by Suicide and What Can We Do to Prevent It, which was published in May 2021. Professor O'Connor has also been the United Kingdom National Representative for the International Association for Suicide Prevention. And in that capacity, he was co-organizer of the 30th EASP World Congress held in his native Derry in North Ireland in 2019. He's passionate about mentoring the next generation of suicidologists. To this end, he is co-organizer of the Early Career Researchers Forum on Suicide and Self-Harm, which is held in Glasgow. He is a member of the American Association of Suicidology. He serves on the Scientific Review Board of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And he's an associate editor of Archives of Suicide Research, Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior and Behavior Therapy. He is also on the editorial board of Crisis. Professor O'Connor acts as an advisor to a wide range of national and international organizations, including national governments on the areas of suicide and self-harm. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Professor Rory O'Connor. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rory O'Connor and I am president of the International Association for Suicide Prevention. So I'm absolutely delighted to be with you today, World Suicide Prevention Day. So my plan over the next 40 or so minutes 
is to say something about some of the work that we've been doing and others have been doing, looking at the relationship between COVID-19 and the psychology of suicide and suicide risk. But before I do go into the details of the presentation, my plan is to say a bit about YASP. So YASP um, is the global, the leading organization globally to dedicate it to the prevention of suicide. And we're very honored that we do so in collaboration with the World Health Organization, as well as a range of other uh, international organizations such as yourselves. And it's that, through that partnership working that we're able to have the greatest impact working globally, nationally, and at a community, and indeed at an individual level. We're a not-for-profit, non-governmental organization. And so you can see here in terms of what we aspire to do is to obviously prevent suicide and suicidal behavior. But not only that, but also to alleviate its effects and also to provide a forum for a whole range of stakeholders with an interest in suicide prevention, be they academics, researchers, mental health professionals, those working at the front line, be it in crisis services, volunteers, as well as anybody else involved in suicide prevention. But crucially, crucially and at the heart of everything we do, is that bringing on board and working in collaboration with people with lived experience, living experience, both of being bereaved by suicide as well as experiencing suicidal thoughts um, oneself or in, uh, having a suicidal history. We're truly global in our reach in that we are represented in 78 countries from uh, six continents and, and at the heart of everything is our members. And many of you hopefully will be members of YASP, and if not, please consider joining YASP. Um, it doesn't matter what aspect or what role you play, you have a place in uh, YASP. So please consider, consider joining YASP. Um, and thank you for uh, inviting me here today as a representative, as a president of YASP. So in terms of what I'm hoping to do over the period is, We'll touch a bit about the scale of the challenge of suicide prevention. As I say, given that we're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, I'll talk about that. I'll touch briefly on myths around suicide. Then I'll go into detail on a model of suicide, the IMV model of suicide, which I'll des describe in due course. And then crucially, one of the big challenges we have in the field is not only is it to understand or identify who becomes suicidal, but also understanding this transition from thinking about suicide to acting on your thoughts. And then we'll end with some reflections or challenges and opportunities. Much of the work that I'll touch on today is, um, uh, is led by my, myself and colleagues at the Suicidal Behaviour Research Labor Laboratory at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. So I'm quite a distance away um, from yourselves in Jamaica, but we have um, really great links in, in terms of international collaborations um, with, with colleagues throughout the world. And it's that collaboration work, which is absolutely vital. And indeed, um, a, a colleague of mine from, from Jamaica, um, Carol Powell Booth, who's just finished her PhD, has been working with us um, in the last uh, three or so years uh, on work conducted in, in Jamaica. Um, but with uh, working with some of the ideas that we have in the lab. Okay, so moving on then, um, the ripples of suicide in terms of the scale. So there's different ways in which we can conceptualize these ripples. Now the often cited statistic is 800,000 people die by suicide globally each year. There's some updates to that. More recently, I've, I think the World Health Organization have suggested maybe 703,000 people are dying by suicide each year. And these are just estimates. So it's at the very least between 700 and 800,000 people each year. Because we know that suicide is, has historically and, and in modern times has been underreported for a whole range of reasons to do with stigma, to do with um, criminalization and so on. So, but at the very least, it's a vast public health concern with at least 
seven to 800,000 people dying by suicide. Then if we think about the people who are affected by suicide more broadly, Julie Carell in the United States has estimated that for every person affected by suicide, maybe 135 people will know that person. So if you do the maths on it, that means that globally every year there's a, at least 108, 000, or 108 million people potentially affected by suicide because they potentially knew the person who died. Or another way of looking at the scale of the challenge we face is globally every 40 seconds someone loses their struggle to live and maybe another 20 will attempt suicide. Now, the other, in terms of what we know about the scale of the challenge, is that the rates of suicide differ across continent, across country and within country. And indeed, if we look at Jamaica, these are data I just took from macro trends. And we know on the global level that the suicide rates are, have been relatively are low um, relative to other countries globally, about 2% and um, every 100,000. But there may be some evidence here of a bit of increase. So it's important that although the rates of suicide in Jamaica are, are low, we should never lose sight that behind every one of those statistics is a tragedy and potentially tragedies which we can think about or trying to prevent in the future. Okay, so that's a bit on the scale of the challenge. What I want to do now is pivot into talking about the pandemic and its uh, impact on, potential impact on suicide and mental health more generally. At the start of the pandemic in March, April 2020, which seems such a long time ago, um, with colleagues here on, on this slide, Emily Holmes and I, um, two psychologists, and then two psychiatrists, Matthew Hothoff and Ed Bullmore, we convened a group of, of, of so-called experts and people with lived experience, experts and lived experience as well, academic experts and lived experience experts, to try and ensure that the uh, mental health was prioritized in the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. Because obviously, understandably, at the very start of the pandemic, in terms of the early part of 2020, all of our, all of our attention was understandably on the impact of the physical consequences of the virus in terms of death. But we need to bear in mind that, yeah, the physical impacts are important, but we were absolutely um, determined to ensure that the mental health um, aspects were also prioritized. And that this paper was our attempt of trying to ensure that was the case. And also around that time, working with David Gunnell, who convened the COVID-19 suicide, uh, suicide prevention uh, research collaboration. What we were keen to do there was all of our concerns was our fear that with the pandemic and perhaps associated um, economic um, recessions and, and, and strife uh, and the huge, huge social upheaval that there, our concern was the suicide rates may increase. And so what we called for were governments and other organizations to act then, act then as in where we're at the start of the pandemic so we could mitigate any risk, so we could mitigate that risk of suicide rates increasing. And, and this slide here really illustrates that quite nicely, areas in which we could intervene, governments could intervene to protect those who are vulnerable, as well as the wider population. And we also call for um, researchers and data monitoring experts to really try and get a better surveillance or better understanding, not only of the rates of suicide, but also understanding of the potentially new risk factors, as well as trying to look at other ways of monitoring um, risk in terms of non-fatal suicidal behavior and su uh, suicidal thoughts. And also, again, around that same time, together with other colleagues in Scotland, in Canada, and in Ireland, uh, we published uh, a systematic review in which we tried to see what do we know about the impact of other infectious diseases in other contexts in, in past and history, as well as obviously what we might have learned so, um, immediately in the aftermath of the pandemic beginning, in terms of the relationship with was suicide. And, and what the evidence was telling us was that, yeah, the findings supported an association between previous pandemics and increased risk of suicide related outcomes. So, it really highlighted the importance that we prioritize suicide prevention and mental health in the time of COVID. Also, uh, um, towards the end of 2020, um, what was becoming clear was that, that there was a growth in our people prioritizing and talking about mental health. But it was still too early to tell. And still, to my mind, 
even though I will talk to you now in a second about the evidence thus far, what we know, um, it's still too early to tell what the longer term impacts will be. So vigilance, I think, is the, is the key word. So then if you do move on to the evidence of what we know about uh, the impacts of COVID-19 on suicide, I mean, most of the studies that have been published thus far, the large scale studies, are really only considering the first part of the pandemic. And indeed, as a good example of that, Jane Perkis in the University of Melbourne and Anne John in the University of Swansea in particular, they had a group of us, as you can see, there's about 70 of us or so here. And what we were able to, able to do was collect data, preliminary data from uh, 21 countries across the globe. Now, most of them granted are in high income countries. But from those data, trying to get some sense of, could we look at, is there any evidence these data only cover the period of the pandemic up until the 31st of July, 2020? Was there any evidence of an increase in suicides? And the reassuring news and reassuring conclusion was no. Thankfully, at that early stage, there was no evidence, no, no coherent evidence of an increase in suicides as a consequence of the pandemic only in these countries that we're talking about, these 21 countries, mostly high income, and remember only cover the first few months of the pandemic. Now, our conclusion in the paper is that we really need to remain vigilant. And I suppose that will be my sort of watchword for today, that vigilance, being vigilant is absolutely crucial um, as, we, as we continue to navigate the recovery. And the other thing to say about these data thus far is, they, those data hadn't really done subgroup analysis of particular groups of people at risk. And as I, say, as I said already, didn't really look at um, the low and middle income countries where there were some concerning signals. And indeed, if you move on from July and look at some of the um, data from Japan, there's some evidence in, that of this increase come, you can see here in the, in, the, in the late summer, August time, where the suicide rates in particular amongst females increased in Japan, and after a, a period in which the suicide rates had been actually decreased. And indeed, again, looking at, don't worry about all the details, but again, more evidence when you do a sort of more sort of sh shine a light more in more detailed groups. So you can see this increase in uh, females and also this marked increase in young people as well. Um, so that young people message I'll return to in a second, because one of the things we know now looking from a data looking at older indicators of, of suicide risk, is that the data are highlighting groups of people, in particular young people, who might be, whose mental health seems to be most affected. Okay, so what I want to do now is just turn again and return to trying to understand, not just in COVID-19 times, uh, suicide risk, but much more broadly understanding suicide risk in the context of um, a model of suicide or framework. So this biopsychosocial model of suicide risk, which we published um, in 2019, is led by Gustavo Turecki at uh, McGill in, in Montreal. Um, but what I really want you to take in this slide is the fact that for all of us to recognize that we're, if we're to understand suicide risk, we have to take a lifespan perspective. And we also have to recognize that, that the domains of risk span social context, social background, uh, biological factors, clinical factors, cultural factors, and psychological factors. So even if we just look at this top bar here, the like geographical location is there. And that's that recognition, as I said at the outset, that the impact of suicide is different in each country of the world and within countries. Full range of norms and cultural factors impact, impact on suicide risk. There's a whole range of, like as John Donne, the, the philosopher said, many, many years ago, no, no man is an island, this idea that for us to understand an individual, we have to understand effectively their social context. But then there's a whole range of early life experience factors. So I've got early life adversity mentioned here. So trauma, we know is significantly higher than people who attempt suicide or die by suicide than those who don't. And indeed, in a couple of our more recent studies, we find that about 80% of people who attempt suicide will have uh, experience trauma at some stage in their life. And then there's genetic vulnerability factors and family history and then personality factors. And then 
basically psychopathology. We know, and certainly in Western countries and high income countries, suicide usually occurs in the context of mental illness, most commonly a major, major depressive disorder. But to my mind, there are important risk factors to understand the context, but they don't understand, don't help us understand and who, which individual is particularly at risk or trying to understand what suicidal thoughts or feelings feel like. And I suppose that's where this bit here comes in and what I'm really going to focus in much of the remainder of my talk on today is this sense of entrapment. So that hopelessness in a particular sense of being trapped by mental pain, of maybe feeling a burden on others or you're not worthy. That entrapment and mental pain is a driver to the emergence of suicidal thoughts. And that's something I'll return to repeatedly between now and the end of my talk. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say with that framework. And again, it's worth saying that all the published material that I've been involved in is available to download from our website. On our web website is suicideresearch.info, suicideresearch.info. But before I return, move on to entrapment in particular and my model of suicide, which it's a key component, I just want to say a couple of things about myths around suicide. Um, so I published a book when it's darkest early in, um, or earlier in the year, in May 2021, and indeed, if you're interested, it covers it, or you can ship it free to Jamaica from bookdepository.com. And but what I tried to do with that was it covers the whole spectrum of understanding and preventing suicide. But one of the things I've got a whole section on is myths around suicide. And here are 14 myths. I don't propose to go into these in, in, in detail. I'm going to talk about two in particular. And it gives a sense of what's important to my mind is 25 years ago, when I started working in this field, these 14 myths persisted. And they were evident then. Now, although there have been advances, they're still evident today. Um, so we've such, although we've made progress in destigmatizing mental health problems and so on, we still have a long, long way to go. So I'll just touch on, on a couple of them. Number four, asking about suicide plants the idea in someone's head. That's such an important message because there still is a lot of people this fear that if I say something, or ask somebody, are you suicidal? That in some way that will make them become suicidal and plant the idea. And that's just not true at all. Indeed, the opposite is often true. Is it, it may be the start of a life-saving conversation, getting somebody the support and help that they require. Or myth number 12, improvement in emotional state means lessened suicide risk. That was a bit more complicated, but the rationale is that, and sadly too many people I know over the years have said, oh, my son or daughter, um, they seem to be doing much better in the days or weeks before they died. They had been depressed, but they seemed to have recovered. I couldn't really understand why. And then the next moment uh, they were dead. And the concern there is what happens is in the de depths of say a depressive episode, an individual resolves that suicide is the solution to their pain or their problems. And once they resolve and decide that's the solution to their pain or their problems, their mood lifts. And it lifts because you think, oh, I've got to, I, I know if all else it becomes so unbearable, I can end my life. And then as that mood lifts, then you, the individual has a cognitive and motivational capacity to plan and carry out the act. Now, of course, if an individual is, um, is depressed, but their either medication or their psychotherapy is, is working or the crisis that was um, engulfing them has subsided, well, of course, that helps understand why you, a mood may, may um, lift. I suppose it's an it's a unexplained improvement in emotional state is what's important. Anyhow, I just thought... In the context of World Suicide Prevention Day, it's important that we try and dispel these myths. And again, if you want to know more about the myths or much of everything I talk about in, the, in this presentation is contained in the book. Please, please um, have a look at the book. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Connor. I'm struck by you talking specifically about dispelling the myths of suicide. So 
uh, that's very timely and looking forward to reading the book when it is darkness, when it's darkest. Next, we will have um, some words from the Choose Life Project, and we'll hear from Professor Nelda Ying, Chairman of the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange, and Ms. Nora Blake, Manager at JSSE. Thank you, Dr. Rule. This is Nora speaking. All protocols observed. Good day, everyone. My name is Nora Blake. I am the manager at the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange, and I'm actually going to be going it alone this morning. I offer apologies now from our chairman, Professor Neville Ying. He's experiencing some significant technical challenges where he is, so he's not able to join me. So <laughs> I have to fit into those big boots now. <laughs> um, thank you. Well, the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange is a partner with um, Choose Life in this um, work that they have undertaken. I just want to give a little background to the audience and to the presenters who might not know who we are, what we're about, and how we um, are set up to facilitate the um, sustainability and the um, funding of social entities such as Choose Life. So you're seeing my screen, everyone? Yes? Okay, so our vision basically is to see Jamaica develop a robust and sustainable social sector by 2030, the magic year, <laughs> through the creation of a platform here that will attract widespread participation in the social economy. I suspect most people might know of the parent company, the Jamaica Stock Exchange. The Stock Exchange exists to mobilize resources into the private sector. And if I might just you know, plug and remind persons that the Stock Exchange has not once but twice been um, chosen, selected, um, given the distinction of being the number one performing stock exchange in the world. And I say that because it has value to what we will do in the social stock exchange, because we're modeling and we certainly can draw from the experience of our parent company. So we too have a big vision, right? But the idea is to get the social sector in Jamaica robust and sustainable. The mission therefore is that we have to create a fair, efficient and transparent medium that will enable long-term sustainability to come to the social sector by facilitating access, by facilitating social and economic inclusion and greater equity. As you know, our social sector organizations generally fall into the MSME sector and certainly the social sector organizations are the poor relations of business in Jamaica and maybe globally. However, we're here to help to facilitate that change. Our core values, of course, being accountability, trust, integrity, fairness. We want inclusiveness. We want to see equal opportunity and significantly access, access to finances and resources. We're non-discriminatory. We operate in a transparent, um, professional manner, delivering a high quality service to the public and to the sector that we serve. Why are we doing this? There are some socioeconomic issues that need to be addressed that our parent company, the Stock Exchange, believe it's imperative if Jamaica is to advance and be developed in a balanced way, in a way that is sustainable, not just to have a high performing stock exchange, which reflects that we have an economy that is doing well, but we have socioeconomic problems that have to be dealt with. We have young men at risk, unemployed persons with disabilities. Generally, we have high unemployment. We have young persons with suicidal tendencies significantly, and hence Choose Life Project. We have um, the problem of poor values and attitudes in our schools amongst our um, young people. Unemployment in our 
inner city communities and low development. Of course, a lot of this um, leads into the crime and violence, which is probably the number one problem that we all think Jamaica has. And there is also a nuance where you have Jamaica being what it is, has a lot of um, cultural legacy. Um, um, well, we have been named a creative city of music by the UNESCO. We have world heritage sites and all of that. Bob Marley is the most recognized um, face on the planet. So is Usain. But we have all of this and we don't know how to monetize, to create wealth, to create employment. So those are some of the issues that we grapple with in Jamaica that we hope to assist with. Um, we recognize that we can't do this alone. So our tagline is social development through partnership. And these are just some of the brands. Some of them are companies that are listed on the stock exchange. Some are not, who have from day one decided that they want to partner with us in this effort to build a sustainable social sector. What are our key strategic objectives to get this done? Um, or what is it that we're after? We're after achieving a balance between economic and social development. As I intonated earlier, it can't just be about a high performing stock exchange. It has to be about a balance for national development. So we will, as an objective, strategic objective, provide a platform for the long-term growth and development of the social sector. This we will do by establishing two markets, just as the regular stock exchange, for those who don't know, has two markets operating in Jamaica. We have a main market for the bigger, larger, more mature companies. And then we have a junior market for companies that graduated out of the SME sector, small companies. And that is a market that has really done very well. So our market one will be what we call the Jamaica social investment market, which is a market that will attract donations. It will be the market where we will seek to build the um, capacity of our not-for-profit entities. And here you will not receive a return financially because you're making donations as you will today and going forward for Choose Life, <laughs> for example, right? The return is a social return on investment. One of the things that we want to do on the exchange is we're developing tools to be able to measure the impact and the value of this intervention, this type of intervention, how it impacts GDP, right? So it's very, 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 very important and critical that the donations come in for the not-for-profit sector. As we mature into the social stock exchange, and as we await the government on legislation, we will have a second market, which will attract investments to um, social sector organizations that operate a business. Yeah, in this market, your investment will be able to possibly bring you a return, a financial return. So you will probably get an increase in the value of the equity, the share that you invest if Choose Life decides that they would like to also operate a social enterprise arm and they get listed on the second market, you invest in that market and then you might get a return, the equity value might go up or you might get a dividend ever, ever so often as happens on the regular stock exchange. So on this market, you will see social business enterprises that will be, um, you know, into the process of innovating, growing along a trajectory that the social stock exchange has actually provided for them to be able to move along. So, um, you know, that's the future and it's very exciting, right? In fulfilling our purpose through market one, just wanna give you a quick overview that to date we have been able to fund to the tune of over $33 million for our projects um, that you see here. Two of them were specific responses to COVID. That would have been our project for the ventilators at the university and for the um, Teen Challenge project, which deals with young men at risk from addictions, but their farm, which support their social mission, was having an economic 
um, crisis due to the pandemic because they sold their um, their produce and their livestock and their chickens to the hotels on the North Coast. Uh, with the advent of COVID, they ran into a crisis. And that now is an example of how you can have a social business operating in the social sector. All right, but we'll talk about that more. The Alpha and the DEFCAN projects have been fully funded on the social stock exchange. Um, our next targeted project is what we're about today. Choose Life International. The Shalom project is a community level project that operates a social intervention through partnership with schools, community NGOs by using, deploying, seeking to deploy what they call Choose Life Ambassadors to be able at the community level on the ground to be training persons in suicide prevention, the art and science of happiness, stress management, conflict re resolution, trauma intervention, and basic counseling skills. We believe this grassroots approach will help to address Jamaica's growing murder, murder suicide, and the mental health crisis that is even now being brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. We're just not exempt from it. So the JSSC, um, in that context, we make an appeal, yeah? Because there's a toll on the economy, on our individual lives, in the communities all around. And we have seen, like I explained earlier for the Teen Challenge Project, in the social sector, many organizations have had to close their door. Uh, some have been able to exist limping along, very marginal service, not being able to deliver the level of impact that they can. And so we're saying in this time, contribution to our social development is needed even more now than it was before, even though we ourselves are being impacted economically, I know, I'm saying we have to, we have to find that space to keep the social sector going. We can't afford for any more of our social intervention projects to close and certainly not choose life. Not today, not ever. So I'm gonna today take um, a bold step on World Suicide Prevention Day and focus your attention to what we do at the Social Stock Exchange on the Choose Life Project. The Choose Life Project tells us from the work that they have been doing that our young adolescent Jamaicans are particularly at risk. We have the statistics, the studies show us that up to 25% have considered suicide at some point in their lives. 18% actually have attempted suicide. The good news is the project called Choose Life International is able to assist in providing counseling session, um, services in being able to provide intervention at the community level, in our schools and so on. So we're making this special appeal today to all who are here on the conference and after the conference, please share this information. It's a very, very, very easy process to just go online and support the project. You don't have to get up, you don't have to, it's not even as difficult as going to the supermarket. You sit there, you can go to our website, which is jssdja.com, and you can make a pledge using your credit card, your visa debit, or if you have a PayPal account, you go to the website and you click on Choose Life and simply click to donate. If you are not in a position to actually make that donation because whatever is happening there, please, you can make a pledge and we will follow through with you on that. Some persons now are saying, well, could I just do a bank transfer? Yes, you can. Our account at NCB, Constant Spring, NCB, 
which for the Jamaican account, it's a checking account. That number is on the screen. It is 294-021-426. That's our Jamaican dollar checking account at NCB Constant Spring Road. We also have a US account at the NCB Constant Spring Road. Um, that number is 294-021-434. I'm going to also tell our viewers, our partners, potential partners in the diaspora, that you can also naturally do transfer by wire if you need to. And you can go onto the Choose Life website, their website, and you can also interact directly and get the benefit of a 501c3 status. They're registered in the US. So basically, that is it from us at the Jamaica Stock Exchange. We're just highlighting that today, being World Suicide Prevention Day, it's a call to action. It's a time for each one of us to you know, just make that push, make that effort and support this intervention because it has proven to have significant impact. And I believe what um, Professor O'Connor has shared and what will come later will be more than convincing that it is a worthy cause. So at this time, I would just like to say thank you in advance on behalf of Choose Life International for the outpouring of support that will come to the project. And I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank presenter, Mrs. Michelle Chong, who I actually spoke to before we came on. And I'm gonna use her as an example. She's gonna kick off the donations for us. She has pledged a personal donation of $30,000 for Choose Life International Project. And so the platform is open 24 seven, jsseja.com forward slash projects or forward slash um, is projects or, well, projects will do. And you make your contribution as easy as taking out that credit card, looking up that PayPal number and doing your donation. So on behalf of the conference host, and all the persons who are putting in their effort today and the lives that we will save. We at the JSSE want to thank you for partnering with us on this effort to prevent suicide and to help our people to learn how to resolve their conflicts and how to be happy. We are Jamaicans. We were, no, we were known to be a happy people. Let's restore that to our people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Blake. And on behalf of the presentation from Dr. Professor Ying, who could not join, I have one ask if you could, before I introduce the next speaker, if you could drop that information for JSSE, as well as the banking information in the Q&A box so persons can access it. I will do so. Great Thank information. You. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for that information. Great information. Even though this is World Suicide Prevention Day, the, the appeal doesn't end today, right? So it's ongoing both for suicide prevention as well as mental health illness and conditions in Jamaica and globally. So thank you so much, um, Mrs. Blake. Thank All right, you, well, Dr. Oh, you're welcome anytime. Your next person you're gonna hear from is Mr. Keith Ellis, Choose Life International Board Chairman, who will give you remarks. Um, declaring the conference open and a prayer of dedication. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends all. It gives me tremendous pleasure on behalf of the board of Choose Life International to declare this our 13th annual World Suicide Prevention Day seminar open. Our theme is creating hope through action. And that is precisely what we hope to achieve today. To begin our seminar in an uh, appropriate manner, I invite you to pause while I pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We come, Lord God, recognizing your presence with us and giving you thanks. We pray, O oh Lord God, that everything will work according as you have planned it. 
And Lord, we pray that everything that is said and done will endure to your glory. We pray for a blessing upon all of our speakers, all of our volunteers, everyone participating in this seminar. We ask for your mercy and your grace. Be with us now as we seek to honor you with that which we do today. Amen. God bless you. And remember, as we share together, as we participate in the learning, have a wonderful seminar. God bless you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ellis. Okay, we're coming to the end of the opening ceremony and we will hear from Mrs. Faith Thomas, who will deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. All protocols observed. It is really a wonderful day to be here on World Suicide Prevention Day, celebrating life, celebrating hope. And I want to thank our moderator for the opening ceremony, Dr. Gary Rule, who is out, out of the, the Jamaica diaspora. Thank you so much for your moderation. So I greatly appreciate it. Thanks also to Reverend Dr. Peter Garth, president of the Umbrella Group of Churches, who did the prayer to start us off with a roar. We give you thanks, sir. Mrs. Dana Cameron, who represents the Jamaica Broilers Group, who is our premium sponsor today. Thank you very much for your greetings. And thanks also to all of our, our sponsors. We have bronze sponsors, Courts Jamaica Limited, Hawkeye, Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, and session sponsors, Barita Limited, Garden Life Jamaica, Jamaica Institute of Financial Services. To all of you who are partnering with us, we are very grateful. Also to Dr. Nadine Williams from the Ministry of Health, who has, the ministry has partnered with us over the years. Thank you very much. To Professor Grore O'Connor, our the guest speaker in the opening ceremony. Thank you, sir, for that overview. Then, Miss Nora Blake, wow. She has been with us through thick and thin. And as she has told us about the Choose, choose Life, um, what do you call it now, the Choose Life program, the one that we're doing on the JSSE, please partner with us in sponsorship. Thanks again to our board chairman, Mr. Keith Ellis, for declaring the seminar open and we look forward to a great day. To all of you from near and far who are with us today, thank you very much. And we give thanks to God for his goodness. We look forward to a great day. So without any further ado, we are on. Bless you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Blake. So we are at the end of the opening ceremony. Please stay tuned, get a bathroom break if you can, grab your coffee, your soda, whatever you need as a bread beverage, and please hang on to then go into the presentations for the evening. World Suicide Prevention Day, it's really important. It's a call to action. We need your help. We've provided the websites, the information, the banking data, Please, it's a call to action. Help us, help Jamaicans, and let persons with mental health issues who are thinking about suicide know they have a friend, they're not alone, and help is available. Thank you so much. Mrs. Thomas.
Thank you for saying thanks to everybody. I don't know why I didn't say thanks to your husband, but I understand. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been great just serving in partnership with you over these years. We, I just want to endorse a word of thanks. It is just such a privilege to have all of you being a part of today's event. You know, we come from there, we come from far. And whether we are at yard or abroad, the issue of suicide stares us in the face. This morning, before coming to this seminar, I went to the viewing of a young man who died by suicide. Right now, the funeral is taking place just down the road um, here in Jamaica. It pains my heart every time a suicide happens. And I call upon all of us to do all we can to be able to just make that difference. It is a problem around the world. We say a big thank you to our planning team and to the board and staff and to all our technical people behind the scene. You know, we see our technical people only when things go wrong or mostly when things go wrong. But we say thank you, thank you, thank you. Mrs. Thomas is saying thanks and thanks to all of you. But now we're going to pick up because it's just the beginning. We're saying thanks. What is in the middle of it? Love uh, has been with us and we wanted to just express Thanks to Love, who is actually Love Radio. Um, they were actually streaming, I think, on their Facebook page. And uh, we uh, they're going to leave us now and we say a big thank you to them too. Choose Life International has a this flagship, flagship suicide prevention. And uh, we're going to go through an intense day. So I think you have taken your stretch by this. You have grabbed your water and we are going to pick up it is my pleasure to introduce to you the moderator for the next session, uh, Ms. Karen Carberry, author, consultant, family therapist, accredited systemic supervisor, lecturer, international speaker, trainer, and researcher. Let's make welcome from London, England, Karen Carberry, our moderator for our next session. Let's welcome her. Good afternoon from England. We've already had my colleague from Scotland. So we have the UK contingent in the house. And I am very pleased to be here um, another year, um, not there in person, but I do hope that we can all come together again sometime in the future in person. We look forward to that too. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ganesh Shetty, consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist. Dr. Ganesh Shetty is a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist naturalized in Jamaica. He supervises the clinicians at the Child Guidance Clinic. He also has public practice in uh, Shekinah House, Seymour Road, off Old Hope Road in Kingston. He holds uh, MBBS, uh, JN and Medical College at Medical College from Karnataka. In university, university in India. Um, he also has qualifications in psychiatry from the University of West Indies, fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry, and also uh, masters in public health with a distinction from the University of West Indies. He's a clinical fellow in child and youth psychiatry, and his affiliations include currently co chair. Uh, the Jamaican Academy of Child and Adolescent Mental Health, former Vice President of the Jamaican Psychiatric Association and Canadian Academy, Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Dr. Shetty has extensive research publications and presentations, which include intervention for traumatized children in West Kingston. Uh, he also uh, 
has presentation psychosocial aspects of child and adolescent sexual abuse presented at the National Mental Health Officers Symposium at the Jamaica Conference Centre. Use of play in trauma-focused CBT workshop. Um, also, evidence-based treatments for childhood trauma presented at the Jamaica Psychiatric Association Annual Conference of 2000, uh, 2011. Dr. Shetty has special interest in public education about mental health issues to enhance early detection, treatment, and mental health promotion. He has served on the Technical Oversight Committee of Reduction of Juvenile Population in State Institutions and on the Steering Committee of the Orphans and Other Vulnerable Children Secondary to HIV and AIDS Program of Ministry of Health and has provided technical assistance to the St. Andrew Care Centre, a rehabilitative program for youth living and working on the street. So as we can see, Dr. Shetty believes that the community and school-based interventions uh, with active participation of community is the way to provide and sustain child and adolescent mental health services, uh, targeting dysfunctional children and their families is vital to deal with the issues of psychoeducation and non-compliance but also to foster community participation in caring for our mentally challenged children. Dr. Shetty also believes that all members of the clinical and school team with a sound background knowledge of child and adolescent mental health issues and community-based uh, mental health interventions can provide with the technical support of the child and adolescent mental team, the kind of leadership that can lead to better outcomes for our youth. Dr. Shetty's goal is to create an environment with the support of colleagues in which each member of the team feels empowered and motivated to provide such leadership. Isn't that just marvelous? So we are honored to have Dr. Shetty here to do a 20 minute presentation entitled Children Adolescence and the pandemic in stealing hope. Welcome, Dr. Shetty. Thank you very much for those kind words, Ms. Carberry. All protocols are observed. Greetings, my brothers and sisters. One love, one heart, one destiny. I want to share my screen so you can start my presentation. So the topic is children and adolescents and the pandemic instilling hope. Uh, hope, fostering hope to live, love, learn, laugh, and lead the transformation. I always try to focus on the weakest link in my presentation that is um, poor and unattached youth who are traumatized and live in violence infested communities and often come from homes with a single parent with unemployed and such. But my colleague told me, Ganesh, don't go there and tell all this bad news because that will make people more hopeless when they leave. So I'm trying, going to try my best. Uh, but the man with the funny hairstyle uh, told that uh, we can learn from yesterday, live for today and hope for tomorrow, but we should never stop asking questions. And with lockdowns, I got a lot of time to think about questions. I said, we are still disconnected by race, still separated by religion, divided by politics and classified by wealth. We still are being exploited by a monetary, military, missionary and materialistic system. Is COVID an equalizer or a reset button was my questions. And we still have the power gradient. We are powerful and powerless, can powerful with purpose empower the poor. We have a monetary system where rich and poor are so divided. Yes, 25 families own 40% of world's wealth and two people in US hold 40% of wealth of people in US. Uh, can rich enrich the poor? Um, we live in a military system where uh, Jamaican government has JDF and the Don in the ghetto has 
DDF, Dawn Defense Force, and then constant combat and innocent people get caught and killed. And we have part of Jamaica proper and we have part of Jamaica where there are different rules which are ruled by Dons. And we have a missionary system where there's so many church leaders doing some wonderful job of outreach, lifting the poor and the needy. And then there are others who exploit poor people to fuel their car and finance their Mercedes Benz. Uh, so the issue is about appreciating the good and admonishing the ones who are exploiting. We also live in a material system where we buy stuff we don't need with the money we don't have. And we live in a money-based economy and not the community and resource-based economy. So first of all, I think we need to understand hopelessness or else we'll be hopelessly enslaved believe falsely that we are free. So what are the factors feeling hopelessness? Is the COVID pandemic superimposed on crime with epidemic, which is crime and violence epidemic. So we have poor parenting skills, poor psychosocial support, adverse childhood experiences, trauma, and unidentified and untreated mental disorder, fueling a lot of problems in the society, crime and violence, drug abuse, teenage pregnancy, and such increased risk of physical disability like diabetes, cancer, and such. And with COVID pandemic on onslaught with this new variants, there's a likelihood of uh, caregiver breadwinners being affected and dying. Uh, school closures could continue, job loss and business bankruptcy could overwhelm the economy. And that could increase crime and violence and risk of domestic, domestic violence, child abuse, and such. Uh, we have an education system which installs a lie that you're only as good as your grades. Your future is only as bright as your grades, which stresses children with long, boring online classes now and heavy load of homework, which kills their creativity and encourages them to succumb to job slavery. Are we preparing them for the past or future? In primary school, they say, if you don't do the homework, teacher will be upset. And when you don't pass PEP exam, you'll go to done school. In high school, they're told, if you don't do well in six, you don't go to college, you go to supermarket and buy groceries for people. So we foster fixed mindset, which believes intelligence is fixed and is not malleable, a potential that can be developed, which is true. And we praise intelligence and not so much the effort. So these students think that looking smart is the most important thing and say things like, main thing I want when I do my schoolwork is to show how good I am at it. Whereas it should be learning is most important. It's much more important for me to learn things in my class than it is to get best grades. And the folks with fixed mindset think putting too much effort is negative. Whereas the folks with growth mindset take pride in the effort they put in. But when failure strikes them, the fixed mindset students will become helpless and try to make excuses or avoid taking challenges. Whereas resilient growth mindset students will take challenge with enthusiasm and take pride in solving the problems. And we have social system which entices youth who are stressed by schoolwork, homework, uh, to get addicted to drugs, alcohol, and social media and video games, and um, keeps youth ignorant about how relationships are controlled by your life traps and romantic relationships are controlled by your attachment styles, compels you to um, get into intimate relationship and have unwanted kids. We have monitor system which considers everything has a price and everything can be bought. And we have a military system, as I mentioned, and a material system where what you possess is most important than who you are and what you drive is more important than what drives you and what is in you is more important than what is uh, on you is more important than what is in you. And we have the propaganda apparatus, media and social media, which is fostering fear and hopelessness. Uh, with words like worrisome beta, deadly delta, mysterious mu, and such, ticking time bomb. Uh, don't frighten kids. Give them some hope, which can help 
to energize them to find ways to overcome the barriers and reach their goal. And so the challenge is how we're going to change the mindset and create um, from creating jobs place to unleashing the unlimited potential. So we know that COVID-19 has taken a toll on our children. It has health impacts, mental health impacts like anxiety, depression, parents are stressed, children are stressed, they feel isolated, bored. Uh, people cannot visit their families because of um, fear of spreading stuff. And um, it has cost them a lot in terms of income and violence and abuse has, is also on increase. And this is a part of the CAPRI study. Um, since uh, schools are closed, the digital uh, disparity has become very evident and um, there's fear of infection when they return to school. And not having enough resources, it's difficult to keep engaged in online stuff. And they spend a lot of time in front of screen, sometimes getting addicted to the screen, YouTube, uh, video games, and phone sites. And some of those who might be having pre-existing mental conditions are seeing relapse of anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress. And the families need good protocol schools where children can feel safe once COVID is contained. They need financial support. They need universal access to internet, flexible work and leave arrangements, and they need a lot of support and much um, better mechanism to detect trauma and abuse is uh, needed. And the questions most children have is, am I safe? Are you the people caring for me safe? How will this situation affect my daily life? And parents have to take care of themselves before they can take care of the kids. Eat well, sleep well, and move. Seek help if you need. And although you are distance physically connect socially, uh, my uh, grandnieces had my birthday party recently on Zoom from India. They baked a cake and cut it in from of me and ate it and danced for me and I danced with them. So parents can help the children by being calm, proactive. Routine is very important. Don't shut them up when they start expressing their sad emotions and bad emotions. And it's important to know what they are watching and hearing are they into fake news and uh, conspiracy theories? Find some new ways to entertain them and yourself. And if it is significant change, which is worrying, seek professional help. And with teens, don't call them sissy because they are feeling nervous. And find some healthy way they can entertain themselves. Join them if you can. And don't snatch their phones, which might be the only way they're connecting with their friends. Um, and 